The white gods of the Native American Indians were Greeks. According to claims, in an ancient area it seems that the American continent was colonized by groups of Tartar and Mongolian hunters from Siberia. Logic says that these groups that overrun the American continent pass through the Straits of the Kamchatka Peninsula, the Aleutian Islands then, which in that distant time was a land continuum connecting Alaska with the farthest northern point of Asia. They are the ones who then made the Mongolian type of the Native American Indians. They are the ones that the Greeks found when they reached the hitherto unexplored continent of the western hemisphere of the planet. They are the ones who saw the pure white flesh, the whitewashed cloaks of the Greeks and their high presentation, their ultra-modern boats that looked strange in front of their crude dugouts, and of course they saw them as gods. Or the ancient Native American Indian text writes about the strange visitors who came to their country and brought them culture. The god Helataki was priest and king of the white settlers, whose white, those white people were wise, peaceful, and tall. They had white skin and also long beards. It's logical that the inhabitants of America at that time who were ignore, ignorant of what the earth was like, what area it occupied, and if there were other people somewhere else, that those visitors seemed strange to them, even considering them because of the great morphological differences, but mainly of the knowledge that they possessed something of a kind of gods. And so they created the gods in their imagination on those standards, the standards of the ancient Greeks, who arrived there in the distant land of Hesperia, with their ships and with the culture with them, which they left behind in a world that was still in a primitive state, but not wild. Proof of the assimilation not only of the material part of the culture, but also of the spiritual part which mainly has to do with language and speech. That is why the similarities of many words of the ancient peoples of America with the Greek language are a point of reference for many scientists, locals and foreigners. When after several centuries, the new visitors led by Christopher Columbus appeared on the shores of American coast, the natives welcomed them like gods. The great explorer himself narrates in his memoirs, quote, the only feeling the Indians felt for us was worship and admiration, unquote. And below he adds, quote, as soon as the Indians saw us on their shores, they fell to the ground in rage, raised their hands in the sky full of joy, and they were calling us to go ashore as soon as possible, end quote. The Silk Man Nam Indians of the land of Pyrrhus, America, in a ritual dance, they had dances that referred to Cretan or other ancient Greek places where men were dancing, and usually this was going on before a war. They would dance all night. Now, their tradition said that those who once came and brought them the light of civilization would return. Who gave them the order and the way of how they would live better through a correct and cultural development? They gave them civilization, and that said a lot to those who lived until then in a state that suited animals and not humans. How can they not be grateful to them? How can they not consider them as gods? So the reaction described by Christopher Columbus on behalf of the Native Americans is very reasonable, but it seems more logical when one encounters in the tradition or in their old ancient texts the nostalgia of the return of these people. In their religious ceremonies, the American Indians wear white masks or paint their face white in memory of those white gods who civilized them. Their priests also wear helmets decorated with bull horns. These helmets were worn by the soldiers of Kronos Vilos, but it's also the symbol of the Cretan culture, the times of Minoan, the Eteocretans, the great and strong seafarers of all time. The tall visitors to America, white clad and bearded, as the ancient Indian texts say, are the Greek gods, their gods, of the era of the god kings of Uranus, Saturn, Atlas, Poseidon, Dionysus. Giants are presented to them by many ancient texts of ours. G. 
genus of craters, giants you praise within Olympus, muse, Olympians, writes Hesiod, giving an identification indication of who these tall white giants and bearded creatures were. Annex, child-bearing, child-rearing blood of giants, Nonus the Anisiacs, volume 2, book 40, page 313, verse 315. And Apollodorus says, a giant is born from the sky, but it happened in Palini, book 134. And Plato writes, while this island of Atlantis, a great and admirable power of kings, held the island of many other islands and parts of the continent, and all of them and their descendants for many generations are rulers of many others across the sea, islands, and parts of the continent. It was said that in the past about the word of the gods that they distributed the earth to all, Poseidon Atlantis was inhabited by thousands of spring. End quote. Plato writes about Atlantis, showing us that it was inhabited by the Greek races. The placement of Atlantis in the Western Hemisphere, where, as Plato says, there were other islands and a continent in the island of the Sea of Islands and parts of the continent, reveals a knowledge of the existence of the American continent in Plato's time. Since Plato knows of its existence, it's natural to accept that his accounts of Atlantis in America must be true. And why should we question them when everything is obvious and they talk about the Greeks, the white gods of America, in the remotest years of prehistory? The white gods of America, Indians were, American Indians were Greek. And in order to prove the antiquity of the city of Argos, its founder, Inachus, claims his origin from Oceanus, who was the child of Uranus and Gaea. So Inachus founds the city of Argos, that's near Sparta, and reigned for 60 years with Melia, daughter of Oceanus, and she, and therefore his sister. Here we must clarify that very often in prehistory, we see similar marriages occurring, which is of course symbolic and proves thus the purity of the race, give birth to Phoronius, Agialea, and Io. So let's note here that it's not Io from whose generation Danaos will later be born, who will take the kingdom of Argos, specifically from Gelanoris, the son of Snethelus, and will put an end to the Inachids by creating the dynasty of the Danaids and naming the inhabitants of the kingdom of Argos Danaos, the Danes, that is, the Danites. But her ancestor, the word, the tribe of Dan, that is, the white gods of the, the American Indians were Greek. The Foronian son of Inachus is said to have gathered the people in a city and built a temple in honor of Hera. He also gave laws to the human community, and that is why the city is called Argus Foronikos. It was then that the fight between Hera and Poseidon took place for the protection of the city, and because the Argives judged Hera, Poseidon enraged, throws a water shortage in the area, hence the thirsty Argos. From Kidro, Foronius gave birth to Api, who was a cruel king, but had managed to extend the borders of his kingdom to almost the entire Peloponnese of Greece, which takes the name Apia from him. His oppression and cruelty are causes which brought about the displeasure of the world and compelled him to exile himself in Egypt. So we see again a reference to Egypt as the continuation with the tribe of Dan, Danaos, but this is something that we will meet in other cases in prehistory, and I would venture to say that this frequency proves only one thing, Egypt belonged to the Greeks. It may sound strange, but it's true. When the priest of Sidos tells Solon that the Greeks are older than the Egyptians and that the city of Athens existed a thousand years earlier than Egypt, it's not at all impossible to assume that the Greeks laid the foundation of civilization there as well. After all, even after the victory of the Greeks over the Greeks, the Egyptians gave the kingdom to Cronus with Hermes Trismegistus, Thoth that is, as his secretary, whom the Egyptians worshipped as God and called Thoth. So also, Apis, as we know, was a deity of the Egyptians. The white gods of the American Indians were Greek. Indian swords were found 
in the American continent. The white gods of the American Indians were Greek. Mycenaean swords were found. According to others, Pharaonius gave birth to three sons, Pelasgus, Iasus, and Agenorus. And as we read in the Orgigia of Stagiritius, these three shared the kingdom of Pelasgus, and Pelasgus received the part around Erasinos River, where he also built Larissa of Argos, a name he gave in honor of his daughter Larissa. Iesos received the place that was located towards the area of Elidos, and finally Agenor, who took the paternal horses because he fed many, as we are informed by Sagaritis. This is from the Ancient Greek Spirit website, Lia Vlahu, article writer, and uh, I've translated this for you from a Greek article. Please leave your comments. Thank you for your support. Kindly support my Patreon account. The daily posts are five videos daily, and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box below.